Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers. All right, first of all, I got something I got to say. You know, I often end this podcast by talking and encouraging people to post reviews and rate the podcast. It helps people find us, all of which is true. And many of you have in the past. We've had great stuff from David Corbley and James from Waco. But this week, we got a review from LP2009. I don't know who that is. I don't know if you're male or female. But it was this wonderful five-star review about how you discovered the podcast. You're watching all the old ones now uh, while you, you know, do chores around the house and whatnot. It was wonderful. But here's the quote. Uh, here's the part I just got a quote. She, it says, and the host does a great job of interviewing. I really look forward to the housework now. I mean, come on. Uh, everybody likes a stroke every now and again, but likes housework, that's saying quite a bit. So many thanks to LP2009. I got another, I got an email actually from somebody listening to it talking about needing to skip sometimes and, and wishing there was a way to do it, which made me think I should point out this podcast does have chapter breaks. If you're listening to the audio edition, I mean, I, I think you should listen to the whole thing, you know, several times, probably beginning to end. But if you need to cheat, need to skip ahead, you're not in the mood for news and the, you want the interview or vice versa, it's, it's, it's got chapter breaks. You can fast forward cleanly. The first chapter is usually the intro or Jesse and I chatter. And the second part is the news. The third part's the interview. And the fourth part is whatever I say at the very end. Jesse, you both listen to and produce podcasts. Do you think people actually use chapter breaks? I mean, they do. I do. Uh, there's a, I, I listen to a couple of different Star Trek podcasts. One of them, a couple. <laughs> the, the, the two hosts uh, spend a good hour just like chit chatting before they even start oh, wow. like, the episode review. And pretty much the, only chapter break is when they start talking about the actual episode and i usually do click <laughs> <Right>. that um <laughs> uh yeah i mean as a producer of podcasts i can tell you i don't use chapter breaks only because my podcast host doesn't have that function yet mm, yeah um and also for, at least for my podcast it would be very hard to make chapter breaks because it's sort of like a like a jam band conversation it, it sort of segues from thing to thing and it'd be right. hard and take a lot of time to figure out what the topics are but a lot of especially like segmented podcasts like yeah, this one like are this one. Pr are pretty easy to chapter break and we probably should be doing that with the YouTube videos too if we if we're allowed to go back in once can there you, can you do um, that i use a program called podcast chapters to put the chapters in the audio version i wouldn't know how to do it on video i think i think it's part of the uh, the back end of youtube uh, so I'll, I'll i'll look into that for us cuz mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that hard cuz i know youtube videos have chapters i see them all the time now I'm not hassling you about the Star Trek podcasts. I love Star Trek. I listen to board game podcasts, but sometimes, you know, if there's a chart, we're going to discuss this at this time. I'll think, no, I don't like that game. I don't want to hear about that and skip it. So, you know, it is useful anyway. All right. My interviewed guest today is Yasmin Engo, a new author who is taking the publishing world by storm. Her debut novel, her name is Night features an elite assassin heroine on a mission to topple a human trafficking ring and avenge her family. It actually goes on sale on November 1st, but you can pre-order it right now. Yasmin is from Northern Virginia, but I think she's in South Carolina, at least today. She's a first-generation Ghanaian Af American who taught English in middle schools and high schools for years and received the 2020 Eleanor Taylor Bland Award for Emerging Writers of Color. She is living the dream of many red sneaker writers, and I want to talk to her about that. But first, the news. So here's my headline for item number one. A renowned female crime novelist who won a million euro prize in Spain 
turned out to be three middle-aged men. <laughs> okay, go with me on this one-of-a-kind story. There's been a lot of speculation about the identity of one of Spain's most prominent crime thriller writers who wrote under the name of Carmen Mola and has attracted a lot of attention. In Spain, apparently, only about 10% of all authors are women, and the bio indicated that she was a professor and then at nighttime was writing these kind of bloody and violent thrillers that were very popular. Well, last week, a forthcoming book called The Beast by this author won the prestigious 2021 Premio Planeta Literary Prize, which, as I said, is worth a million euros for an unreleased book. And they announced the winner. You can see the picture right there if you're watching the video version. And three guys, Jorge Diaz, Augustin Martinez, and Antonio Bocero, stood up. These are all known authors. They've written a lot of television scripts, but they decided to write these books under a pseudonym. Why? Here's a quote. It hasn't escaped anyone's notice that the idea of a university professor and mother of three who taught algebra classes in the morning and then wrote ultra-violent, macabre novels in scraps of free time in the afternoon made for a great marketing operation. Needless to say, much controversy ensued. Honestly, I don't know what to think about this. Jesse, what do you think? Is this a fair PR scheme, or have their reader readers been duped? I don't. I feel, I mean... I feel like there are acceptable times your nom de plume can be a different gender. And right. I feel like that's when you're in a situation, for example, you are a female writer and you're having problems getting published. So you give yourself a male nom de plume or right. you're two men and you give yourself a one single man's name, like James S.A. Corey, the writer of the Expanse series. Right. This feels a little, a little gross. <laughs> well, we have a long history, after all, of women sort of masking their gender with initials. Uh, J.K. Rowling comes to mind, mm -hmm. although pretty soon everybody knew who she was because the books were so popular. Actually, back in the day, uh, virtually all women who wrote in the golden age of science fiction used some kind of male pseudonym because the completely wrong idea was that, you know, this uh, only men wrote this stuff and they'd uh, read this stuff and they'd only read books written by me. So, you know, pseudonyms, but this one does seem sort of like they not only created a false name, but a whole fake identity yeah. to sell yeah. the book. There's yeah, there's more to this than them. Just, it's not like it, it was, it was an accident or they thought it was funny for a day and then just ran with it. Uh, like in a, like a rom-com situation. Like they gave this, right. this, this, a woman author a backstory that was a right. very you know uh appealing backstory and so you know it feels very like you know middle like uh boomer privilege yeah uh, it's you you what you said makes me think it's like the bosom buddies of the book is, world you know yeah, just People. like how bosom buddies has not aged well no, I don't think it would play well at all today no, no. even though they I enjoyed it growing up but seems uh, skeezy but yeah. <laughs> Uh, also, for our listeners, in case you're curious, a uh, million euros would be $1.12 million. Holy smokes. So. Even split three ways. That's money. Yeah. I guess the joke's on them for it being three of them, and they have to split that prize, but it's still a goodly amount of money. Yeah, I yeah. Take you it. pay a few bills with that. Yeah. Okay, item number two, which is equally unexpected, although a happier story. This takes place in Ireland. As you may know, Ireland has been a tax haven for writers and really all artists for a long time because writers don't pay tax. It's not that simple. You've got to qualify. You've got to have lived there for several years. But many writers, successful writers, have moved to Ireland. I think Anne McCaffrey, for one, uh, just to take advantage of this. Well, it just got even better because now Ireland has started a pilot program, three years for the pilot, that's going to pay all artists, including writers, a weekly payment of 325 euros a week. Not as much as those three guys got for writing under a pseudonym, but still a significant, uh, people are calling it a game changer. Artists who typically have a hard time struggling to succeed, they have to you know, uh, uh, have to, probably wanted to teach like our guest today taught or practice law like I did, waiting for the books to take off. But 
now they've got a basic income guarantee scheme to allow them to do their work and make sure they don't starve to death. A gov government rep said this, quote, sends a message to artists living and working in Ireland that their work is valued, appreciated, and necessary. So what do you think, Jesse? See this happening in the U.S. anytime soon? I mean, not anytime soon, but... I think something like this, I mean, this something like this happened during, was it uh, during World War II? Uh, like, you know, the, there was a, the, the, uh, the sort of WPA project. Right. right? During Which, the Depression, right. Yeah, during the Depression, yeah. And a lot of great cultural things came out of that. And I, it's true. I think considering that it's, I did uh, another Google search, uh, that would be $446 a week. Um, that's still not a lot of money. So... I think if people could get over the, um, you know, the basic income part of it, which is like supporting artists so they can be artists, you know, right. I think, I think eventually ideas like this will, will, uh, will catch on probably states first or even cities first, mm -hmm. not like nationally, but it is a great way to at least give them something so they can buy groceries and possibly right. health insurance. Right. Might still need a roommate, but you're not going to yeah. starve. I mean, it harkens back to the old days of patronage which mm -hmm. usually came with strings attached, but that really doesn't exist in our world anymore. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of programs under the uh, new Biden proposals, but I haven't heard of any that pertain to uh, <laughs> helping authors su survive. Yeah, it'd be nice. Listen, I'm, I would happily move to a country that had this for podcasters. So. Oh, yeah, there you go. Well, Ireland has a long history of uh, supporting the arts and uh, supporting their art. And, and, and it's why, because they, you know, they support their own in a way. You know, many states have a poet laureate. In Oklahoma, we supposedly have a poet laureate, but they haven't appointed a new one in something like four years. And they removed the salary. Uh, that the Oklahoma Poet did. Laureate get. I mean, it was a whopping $5,000 for the entire uh, term, <laughs> which would be either one or two years. But now they don't even do that. There's, it's, ju it's just a, a title, and uh, but zero financial support. Well, uh, so I, I don't think we're breaking news by saying Ireland, more supportive of artists than Oklahoma. Yeah, possibly. All right, one last item. A social media app just for authors? What do you think? A woman named Allison Trowbridge has proposed and is apparently preparing to launch a new social media app called Copper. Yes, like the metal, Copper, because she wanted to have something that helps authors exchange ideas and deal with this changing publishing world. She says it's going to disrupt the publishing industry, although I'm not really clear on that part. She talked about in this article about how she, it was in Forbes. So, you know, she's apparently getting some financial support, but she talks about when she was preparing, writing and publicizing her first book, she was very frustrated with all uh, the difficulties in bringing a book to market and uh, the, what she calls shameless self-promotion that an author is supposed to do, quote, the platforms that exist really serve readers, but not authors. That's why you see authors struggling to dance on TikTok or do Instagram reels. It requires a very different skill set. Uh, again, Jesse, I got to turn to you that because this is really more your field of expertise than mine. Do authors need their own platform? Do you see this being a hit? I mean, I so one, I think this is a great idea. Two, I don't think it's going to work. Why and I don't is think, that? I don't think it's going to work because people are already sort of maxed out on apps to check in on. And so anytime you're asking people to join a new thing, like it's, it's a very hard sell these days. Um, if there are ways, and I was looking on the website, which is uh, copperbooks.com. Uh, yes, copperbooks.com. If, if it's all the things that like Goodreads could have been, Right, yeah. where like you actually can interact with the author. I think there would definitely be space for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because, uh, you know, authors just like everybody else have fans and those fans want, want to meet and get to know said authors. Um, right. But it has, to, it has to survive long enough for people to find it. Goodreads is so complicated. I was there this morning because, as you know, my new book came out yesterday. That's Exposed, the second Kinsey book. 
and the page seems so busy. I have a hard time. Oh, thanks. I have a hard time even, you know, uh, navigating it. It's nice. Of course, it connects well to Amazon because Amazon owns it, but it's, it's kind of hard to navigate. I would say every time I finish a book on my Kindle and I try to rate it on Goodreads, it never works. So uh, any system that works better than that, I'm for. Because I would like to talk okay. like if, if you go by Goodreads, the only thing I ever read are comic books. Because the only thing, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the only that's because on my iPad I buy them, not just for myself. But so that's the only thing that shows up on my Goodreads page. I mean, I remember the the Field of Dreams line: "If you build it, they will come." But I don't know if I think authors. I think most authors want less to do with social media, not more. Um, but. I guess we'll see. All right. Interestingly enough, my fantastic interview guest this time connects one way or another with all three of these news stories because she's also got a debut book. Uh, she doesn't need a, a pseudonym, but she's getting all kinds, even without a new social media app, she's getting all kinds of rave reviews and publishers weekly. And look on the cover, you see that great quote from David Baldacci. She is doing very well. Yasmin Ango, please welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Just great. You're you're coming to us from South Carolina, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, yes. I appreciate that very much. So, traditional first question on the podcast. If you could give the writers out there listening any piece of advice, one piece of advice, pick one, what would it be? Um, I would give the advice of uh, make sure that your promise to your reader that you see it all the way through from the start to the finish. And sometimes we don't know exactly what that promise to the reader is when we're initially drafting it or whatever, but it's just whatever you, you say that you're going to deliver to the reader at the time. Just make sure that you see it all the way through. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I always constantly have to work with. And, and when I'm working as a developmental editor and um, working with other authors, that's also something that I try to remember. Sure. This first book of yours, Her Name is Night, is indeed, yeah. it's not even technically out yet as we record this. It's a few days before release, but it's got the most stellar lineup of reviews and endorsements I have ever seen. How long did you spend <laughs> you. writing this thing? Um, so it took me, I started it in, in um, 2018 and then finished it around the summer of 2019, but I had been kicking it around in my mm -hmm. head um, for several years before that. I just didn't know how I was going to execute it and it wasn't coming to me yet as you know, just how I wanted to do it. Um, I kind of had the character um, in my mind. I just didn't know what I, what her story was going to be yet. So in 2018, I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to start. I was writing women's fiction or trying to write women's fiction prior mm -hmm. to that. So then in 2018, I was like, you know what? I'm going to write what's really on my, you know, what I really, really like to read and watch, which is thriller, horror, um, yeah. all those kinds of things. And so I just kind of started it then. Yeah. So about I a year. I can relate. You remind me of my own, you know, when I started, I was going to write this uh, brilliant bit of literary fiction, which oddly enough was later published and didn't change the world, but that wasn't going anywhere. So I thought, <laughs> how about a mystery? I think maybe I could handle a mystery. In, and of course mm -hmm. that's uh, changed everything. So this book is out, uh, you know, uh, you've got a story that's not completely unlike those, uh, the, the, the first news item I talked about, except in your case, the story is actually true. <laughs> you, you actually <laughs> were a teacher and you were an editor and you really are a female. And here's right, your right, first right. novel, right? So were yes, you... and I really have kids too and all of that. So. Uh, well, and we all know how much time that takes out of your day. And somehow you mm -hmm. found time to write. How'd you manage that? Um, I don't know. I, I, I got very little sleep. Um, I just, um, I really had to work. 
I, on my writing during my breaks um, at work, um, try to do it. I try to be an early writer, like writing first thing in the morning, but I just right. can't get myself into that. So <laughs> it's usually during my breaks, lunch. Um, and then when I get home and, and the kids were squared away and by 2018, they were pretty old anyway in, you know, teens. So after dinner, then I had time that evening to write. And so that's pretty much, and then on, on weekends all day, I would write. So that's pretty much mm -hmm. how I did it. Anywhere I could, you know, I could fit it in is where I got it in. Do you have a regular schedule? Do you make yourself write every day? Or uh, uh, that may not even be possible in the life you're living right now, but. Yeah, no, I try though, because I just like um, with outlines, I just, something about structure really makes me kind of nervous. So I uh, really write just when I feel really creative and really compelled, which for the most part is like every day, but like there'll be days that I haven't, like I didn't write today because I just didn't feel compelled to do it. I mean, it just mm -hmm. really has to come to me and I have to feel it's like an urgency. You got to get these words down. And so mm -hmm. that's where I feel like my writing sounds the best is when I'm writing, when I really, really want to do it. And so that's, you know, that's typically how I do it. So there's no set time. Mm -hmm. But if I'm on deadline, like I had to do yeah. with book two, um, then I did make myself write every day, especially when I got closer to deadline, because I couldn't push it, you know, any further. So I made, you know, I made sure that I wrote every evening and definitely on the weekends is when I really kind of like got it in. Well, I think that's a sign of your your dedication. That would never work for me. I can always think of something <laughs> that sounds more fun <laughs> than writing. <laughs> but I have been at it for a while. That might be a factor. But, uh, you know, I have to set my time and make myself go do it. So you didn't outline this at all. Because this is no. a pretty intricate little thriller. There's a lot going on. And yeah. no outline? You just, as no they say, outline. No it. official outline. I pantsed it the whole way through. And then you know, after I did the, the zero draft and I went back and then put in the parts that I felt, you know, were missing or there were a lot of parts, but yeah, I just right. wrote all the way through. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting, this isn't your first draft. Uh, if it is, you're the best first drafter in the history of writing, but, I but that's right. Yeah. That wouldn't be me, <laughs> but still you went through it without an outline. That's really pretty impressive, you know? Uh, so, okay. So you've written this book. What, then did you, how did you, I know you have an agent. How did you find the agent? how did you find the publisher? What happened next? Yeah. So let's see. So I finished, um, in, uh, 2019 and I was with another agent at that time who was trying to sell my, uh, women's fiction. And mm -hmm. I decided that, you know, we had different, um, vision, uh, vision. So I parted ways and decided I was just going to try fresh with this new story that was like a story of my heart. And I just knew, I was like, people are going to love it and it's going to be great and all this other stuff. Um, and I was going to start January of 2020. So January of 2020, I started querying and the rejections just kept coming in and mm -hmm. coming in. And um, I had so many rejections and um, was it wasn't until maybe like May, um, May, early June is when I got... Um, interest from my current agent now, Melissa Edwards. And mm -hmm. by that time, I was like about to quit. I was, I told myself, I must not be good because some, you know, the story <laughs> that I just knew that I was, that, I, that people were going to love, nobody loves it. They're all telling mm -hmm. me no. And I don't know why they're telling me no. Like there's no concrete something that they're saying that I need to fix. So maybe I just suck and I mean, yeah. so I'm just going to quit. And, mm -hmm. um, and then right about the time, you know, I had, I had queried her before that, um, before I had decided I was going to quit. So it was with her and I was like, I'm just going to quit. And then one of my friends in um, one of my writing groups, uh, crime writers of color, she was like, Hey, you know, there's this uh, contest, this Eleanor Taylor Bland award um, with sisters in crime. Why don't you, you know, submit? And I was like, you know, I don't know. And I said, fine, I'll just do this one more thing. I'm just going to do this one more thing. And I'll submit, even though I'm not going to win. It's just because I never win anything. Nothing good ever happens to me and I'm going to quit. And um, so I did. I submitted it. And then I, for, you know, forgot about it because I just knew I was going to lose. And then 
or like I said, um, late May, early June, then Melissa emailed me and was like, mm-hmm. hey, you want to jump on a call? And I was like, what? Like someone yeah. wants to talk to me, an agent? What? <laughs> and like, so she offered and I was just like, oh my gosh, wow. You know, and I was so proud about that. And then I got, I was checking my email like a week later and I saw that I had like an email sitting there talking about, you know, you're a winner. And I thought it was a spam. And I was like, oh my gosh, this stupid spam. I was about to put it in the junk mail. And so I didn't read it for some days and it, I was about to put it in the junk mail and delete it. And I was like, let me look at it again. And it turned out to be, you know, like for real, you're a winner. And that's how I found out that I won the award. Um, but you- and everything went quickly from there. Yeah. But the award yeah. didn't help you get the agent, if I'm following the no, story correctly. The agent came before the award. Yeah. And right the, before and the, the agent award. came from an email query. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think everybody listening to this is going to want a copy of your email query because <laughs> you must have, <laughs> you know, people do drafts and drafts and drafts of those things trying to get it right. And apparently you did. Did you have a special technique or trick or what was it? No, because remember, I've been, I was getting like rejections all the time. So I was like, I suck at email. I don't do well with pitches. I don't do well with um, trying to whittle my, my, you know, 400 page book down into like three paragraphs on a letter. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and sounds like this is why I didn't go into marketing because I just am so bad at it. And so I was surprised too. So she must have seen something, you know, in there that, um, in that mess of a query that, you know, sparked her interest. But yeah, she came before the award. So well, that's fantastic. You're, mm-hmm. That's the dream come true, I know, for, for many listening. And, and l- while I'm thinking of it, let me say, I can see some people are watching this live. If you would like to ask Yasmin a question, please just type it into the chat box and I'll see it or Jesse will flag it so that I have no choice but to see it and, and we'll we'll see that she answers the question so uh this book you know most people's first book is you know the protagonist is a thinly veiled version of themselves and this mm-hmm. book involves a female assassin so i assume that's basically you am i right about that oh who me oh no i don't have <laughs> If that happened, I can't say. No, (laughs) I'm absolutely not that, you know, but um, no, no, no. I mean, there's definitely elements, you know, um, because she's from, she's from Ghana. And so that's where my, my parents were from. They immigrated here from there. Um, And I definitely wanted to highlight my culture with this book. And that was one of the things that really sparked me when I was, um, when I started writing it in 2018 is by that time I was dealing with the death of my dad. He had been Um, He had passed a few years prior to that. And so I was dealing with that grief. So a lot of the themes that you see um, in the book are things that I was dealing with at that time, um, grief and and, Mm. uh, relationships with fathers, great relationships with fathers. I wanted to um, really highlight our culture because that was something I didn't see in these books that I was reading um, and these movies that I was watching was a protagonist that was so much like um, John Wick and Jason Bourne and Jack Reacher and all of them, but you know they didn't like look like like me, and then they definitely weren't from you know a place like Ghana. So I that those are the things that I wanted to write about. The one thing that is similar between me and um, and Nina, the protagonist, is we both like lemon pepper chicken wings. So yeah, when there you, you read go. that, you know that. There is that the author likes that. And so some of my friends, when they read it, they're like, oh, she put the lemon pepper. I can't help it. I love them. So So there is an autobiographical element here. Mm -hmm. Now, was there research involved? I read that you uh, grew up maybe in Virginia. So had you been to Ghana or had you just heard parents stories or what? It was a little bit of both. So I I lived in Ghana for a couple of years when I was very young, so my parents could finish um, school. And then I went back again with my dad several years later to see family and everything like that. But a lot of the um, the the stories and everything um, came from my mom. My mom 
told me just about all of that um, mm-hmm. and my dad too. And, and also, um, yes, I grew up in Virginia, but Virginia, that whole DC area has a really big uh, immigrant culture and a lot of um, Ghanaians um, come there to the DC area to go to school and to work and things like that. So when I was growing up, I actually, you know, was like, in two different cultural worlds. We had I had my aunties and my uncles all over the place. And, and uh, you know, that's who we really socialized with. Um, and then when I'm mm-hmm. at school, then I have my American friends and things. So it was, it was a little, um, it was, it was different, but it was sure. definitely something that, um, that really helped me to become like who I am today. Hmm. And then there's the part about the, uh, being an assassin. How did you research mm-hmm. that? Well, that came from just a lot of, I did a lot of um, search on the internet. Yeah. I, uh, you know, Are we talking dark web here or? <laughs> no, no, not dark web. No, no, no. But I mean, you know, I guess people would, if they saw my, my history, they would be like, you know, what's going on with that? Um, I did, you know, I had, I asked questions of, I have some, um, some, a friend who's in law enforcement. So I asked him, you know, questions regarding, um, weapons and things like that. And I had some friends who, uh, who take self-defense, not self-defense, but like karate and, uh, those kind of fighting courses and, um, MMA, that kind of stuff is what they do. And so I asked them about like different fighting, um, elements. I looked up Krav, Krav Maga, which is something that the, um, main character, uh, she, that's how, that's her fighting style. Well, she tries mm. to or whatever. And so I did a whole lot of research in that aspect. And then also things that I was watching and then books that I was reading as well. And so, I mean, I, I, I tried very hard to, to make sure that what I was writing was, it made sense. Um, well, it made sense to me. And so I would, you know, write it and then I would sometimes like actually try to act out the scenes. So it would be yeah. weird when I have family <laughs> member walk by and I'm like in this position or I have this, you know, I don't have a knife, but I have my pen and I'm like this. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is research. And I look very yeah. serious. And, you know, so <laughs> I'm a method writer. That's what I am. I'm a method writer. Okay. Those, uh, <laughs> those who may be just listening to this on audio, you just messed out on uh, Yasmin <laughs> bringing this book to life. So you, you might want to check out the video later on, on YouTube. You see my fighting moves. Yeah. We got a, <laughs> we got a question here from Sharon, who is also a writer of color, I know, and a wonderful person. And she's okay. asking, first she says that your journey to publication was pure destiny and then she asked what inspired you to write oh wow yeah um so what inspired me to write was if we're talking about way back in the day when i was in middle school and that's when i really started to write what inspired me to write was because I was, I was lonely. I was an only child. And, um, you know, like I said, I was a little different because I had a different, you know, my home life was a little different from everyone else's. And so I, I wanted to write things and, and be in imaginary worlds and, and things like that. And my mom was, you know, working like two jobs at a time. So, and I was with babysitters. So the only way to really entertain myself, if I didn't want to watch soaps with my yeah. uh, babysitter was to write and to read. And so I just really put myself in a world of of reading and then I just decided I'm going to write my own stories and you know my imagination was so big and so that's really how that's what inspired me to write and and writing is cathartic for me so Mm -hmm. even when I don't when you were asking like do you write every day or whatever when I when I don't write even when I don't write I'm still thinking about writing so I literally think about writing 24 7 and when I don't write for too long I start to feel bad and I'm like oh my gosh Mm -hmm. I need to be writing and I don't feel right until I start writing so I really should make myself write every day because then that's when I really it's like a release and I get a lot of things out um but yeah definitely if it's not if if, if that's not what I'm doing, writing literally, then I'm thinking about it all the time. Yeah, that's a story I you think a I lot mean. of people, yes, can relate to. That seems very, very real. So uh, does your female assassin in the book cook? Because I understand you do. <laughs> I, I, at one point, I wanted to be a chef, 
but I just, you know, I didn't do it. But no, she does not cook, actually. <laughs> well, maybe later. Maybe in the, is maybe. there going to be a sequel to this book? There is a sequel, yeah. yeah. I thought that might be the case. Well, maybe But later. there won't be cooking in that one either. No, still <laughs> not. Not from her, at least. You're going to no, have no. to, well, maybe in the supporting <laughs> cast. <laughs> and then pretty soon you'll have recipes in the back of the book. And no, mm -hmm. maybe not. <laughs> but you do like to cook. What's your best dish? I mean, every dish that I try is the best dish, except for fried chicken. I cannot fry chicken. I just don't know what it is. I can't bread it right, so I can't do that. But um, and just about anything that I try, I, I'm pretty successful with it. And I just attribute that to um, going, I went to culinary school and just like I was going to be a, wow. you know, a chef at, at one point. Um, and so I think I attribute it to that. But I mean, I do love cooking. Cooking is another thing that is like a release for me when I have time to do it. Right, um, to enjoy then I'm it. there yeah. and I'm, yes, exactly. And, but I don't do that every day either. I do that less than I do writing probably. Yeah, that that part I can totally understand. But you must have a fa Now, fried chicken was... Well, I, I, my mother once, mm -hmm. I was coming over and she said, I'm making your favorite. And I thought, mm -hmm. I have a favorite? What's my... <laughs> well, it turned out it was fried chicken. I'm not sure, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, you know, she's my mom, so we'll just go mm -hmm. with it. She uh, said, I'm, I'm going to tell you what your favorite is. <laughs> That's right. It is maybe her favorite to cook, because I don't <laughs> think it was is her favorite thing. So, so you spent a lot of time on this book, both the first draft and writing and polishing and whatnot. Oh, Sharon, who I mentioned before, is now in the chat box saying, yeah, I can't fry chicken either. So See, you're there you not go, alone. Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, what are some of the things, there must be a few things you learned about writing in the process. I mean, going from thinking about it, maybe doing some short pieces to actually putting together and polishing up a finished novel, a, a full length novel for publication. You remember any things that maybe you learned along the way that you didn't know before? Um, yeah, I didn't really know all the work that is put into getting it from right. it, what's in your mind into something that is, you know, about to be, you know, published. There's a mm -hmm. lot of work behind it. And you have to look at it a bazillion times and you're like sick of it at this point. <laughs> and um, you have to remind yourself why you like this book, you know. Uh, and so that is, I think, what what I really learned was there is a real true business behind writing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds great when you're like, I'm going to be a writer. I'm just going to write and just everything's going to be beautiful. And you think mm -hmm. that way. And then your developmental editor says, Oh, but wait, this is what we got to <laughs> fix. And then your copy editor is, Oh, but wait, this line doesn't work. Um, and, right. and you're just like crushed. But what I also learned was, if I really, really, truly want to get this thing published, I want it to be in the hands of readers, then I want it to be in the best possible shape that it can be. And that means that I'm going to have to swallow my pride. And yes, this is my baby, but I'm also going to have to be able to receive uh, feedback, um, good feedback, you know, and every feedback that I got was good. Um, but like, I'm going to have to be willing to receive feedback and implement it and think outside of myself because right. you know everybody is trying to make this successful and and not to be too difficult and so that's really what i learned is to not take things sensitive you know personally right. um, and not be over sensitive about my work if i'm serious about getting it out there so um, so that's what I learned. And it also helps me because, you know, I'm a, I'm a developmental editor too. And so that's mm -hmm. something that I, and I did that. I started that after this book was uh, written. So when I became one, um, I was like, oh yeah. Okay. So now I see what it means from the other side. And now I, and it made me even a better writer. I think this time around, because mm -hmm. I can think about what might that editor say to me, let me take myself outside of my author self and make sure that this is as clean as it can be before I send it to them. Though I sent them a hot mess for book two. So I'm just letting you know that thing is even worse than the first one. So they got their work cut out for them in this one. I expect lots of feedback. So I'm trying to prepare myself mentally. <laughs> yeah, that too is a common sophomore experience, but I bet you work through it. I also remember getting my second book back from and this would be back in the late 80s 90s from Random House mm -hmm. and my editor taking a deep breath and saying 
I think this can be salvaged, but uh, oh man, <laughs> career is over before it's already began. But we okay. did salvage it, and it's a lot of okay. people's favorite books. Uh, book, uh, of, I, I think of mine. I mean, I, I think what you're describing is sort of transitioning from writing for sort of uh, for your own uh, uh, therapy or amusement or indulging yourself to writing for publication. I don't think it ever really hit home to me. And again, I'm reaching way back in time, but I remember getting the line edited manuscript of my first book and it's just dripping with red ink because I didn't really know what I was doing. But mm -hmm. I, I looked at this mess and thought, this is actually going to be published. I mean, people are going to read this. People I, I know, people I don't know are going to read this. Mm -hmm. And boy, did I spend a week getting really serious about <laughs> trying to make that book good after that. That changes the whole landscape. It we does, got another really question does. from James, and he wants to know, did you have beta readers when you were? I did. I did. This? I had, um, I had, I maybe had about three people who read parts of it, two people who um, are actually beyond my beta. So they're like my critical partners because they mm -hmm. read the whole entire thing. And so these are uh, two people that I, I really and truly trust. And they gave me phenomenal um, advice on, you know, what to do with a certain aspect um, with the, the organization that I talk about in my book. And, and that gave me a whole different perspective. And so these two, um, reader or yeah the two readers they are they're just great and I'm so lucky to have them one of them is a published author and the other one um she is um she is aspiring to be and so so those were two different perspectives but yeah I I try to I take I value them and I try not to send it to too many people because you know um you get a whole lot of different ideas right. at that point so it's I really um keep it to the people that I trust the most to give me honest um, opinions um, and they know my writing style. And, and so I really value them. Mm -hmm. Sure. I read on your website, which by the way, is very clean, very well done, well executed. Thank you. Uh, Thank but you. I, I read that you listen to audiobooks a lot. Now, what is that because you're on the go all the time and, and can't hold the book in your hand or do you actually prefer <laughs> the audio book? Well, I prefer the audio. I, I used to be like, you know what? I'll never like an audio book. And then I became a developmental editor. And then I was like, I have to use an audio book um, because when I read it with my hand, with, you know, a paper copy, then to me, it feels like I'm working because I have to read, you know, the, the, the editor, the, the authors who are I'm editing, I have to read their work, um, even though that's not like paper copy or whatever. So I prefer... Mm -hmm. Um, in my leisure time to listen to the story. And I also found like, if you have like a really great narrator, man, that story comes alive. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, someone's reading you this story and they're all engaged in it. And sometimes um, it must have been like a Stephen King or a James Patterson. They put some music in that and that thing oh, scared wow. me. But mm -hmm. because it was like, boom, and I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, wow, there's music. I didn't even know that they put music to, you know, some of these audiobooks. So mm. it's like a movie for my ears. And so I really, really love and it allows me to multitask too. So it doesn't feel like work. And mm -hmm. it's just really enjoyable. So I'm an audiobook person. What about you? I know it's my, you're, I'm interviewing you now. What about oh. you? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I used to listen to audiobooks all the time when I drove more, like when I did mm -hmm. practice law and would sometimes have to go here and there. And even more recent, but of course, especially since the lockdown, I drive so little uh, yeah. that I, but I found myself listening to both podcasts and audiobooks using AirPods, like the ones I can see that you're wearing mm -hmm. and, and do it just, you know, like when I'm fixing breakfast or when I walk my cat or whatever, just. <laughs> Did you say when, when you walk your cat? Oh well, yeah. Don't you? I mean, doesn't everyone? I, I, I didn't know people did that. <laughs> I, okay. In a sling. That's he doesn't cool. actually walk, but he likes oh. to get out. And I mean, who doesn't? I wouldn't want to be cooped up in this house all day. Right, right. So do you have a favorite, uh, do you have a favorite book, audio or otherwise? Or maybe when you were a kid, something that stands out that really meant something to you? Sure. So 
one book that really stood out, um, honestly, was To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't mm. know, you know, that's everyone. But I loved it. Right. I really, really loved that story. I loved Boo Radley. It was just something of just the way it was. It was beautiful to me. Um, mm. And so that is my favorite book of all time. Mm. Um, that's a good one. And I... I love, you know, my favorite authors. I love a Stephen King. I love James Patterson. I just read like I love John Grisham. So I and um, Philip Margolin, which you know they're they're fellow lawyers too. So I I really like like all those mm -hmm. kinds of thrill legal legal thrillers and all sorts Great. of things. Um, I read so I read across the gamut though. Um, women's fiction. I'll read some literary fiction if you know if if it's if I can get into it, I mean, but it's got to be, I like something that's like pulse pounding and like is really centered around like right here, right now and, and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's, what's next from you? I think you mentioned a sequel. I don't know if that's going to be your next book. I bet you already signed up for one though. So what can we be looking for you after her name is night? Yeah, so um, so it is a sequel, and that should be coming out next next year. And then, and then I'm just working on some samples for some others that I'm going to um, to sub to the editor and and see you know what she likes. I have some ideas cooking around, so I um, I think I'll do okay with them. I'm excited about them, mm -hmm. um, so no I hope that they'll be excited too, and that I get to do it. It's going to be more uh, a standalone, so it won't be part of the uh, part of this. And I don't know if I'll even have another um, after you know book two. I think I would like to have like a, a three book um, of um, of Mina Knight um, mm -hmm. if if everyone likes her enough that they want that. So that's kind of what my plan was. Yeah, that sounds like a great plan to me. Hey, Yasmin, thanks so much for being on the podcast. And I encourage everyone, this is a terrific book. Pre-order it now or pick it up when it's on the stands. You'll be very glad you did. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. And also congratulations for your book release yesterday. So. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey. Bye. See you again soon, I hope. All right, everyone. Well, you heard me rattling on about reviews earlier in this show, so I won't do it again. But, you know, we do appreciate that. And it does help people find the podcast. And you also heard me inevitably dropping the plug about my new book, Exposed, which just as we record this hit the stands yesterday no longer a pre-order you can get the real deal uh, J jesse showing it with with the first book in the series splitsville and now the new one the second kinsey rivera book where she gets in even more trouble if you can imagine such a thing and that's called exposed let me also say that uh yasmin made it clear how much you know people having her writing group and beta readers meant to her if you're writing or aspiring to write, join our Facebook group, the Red Sneaker Writers Group, so you can get in between updates on what's going on in the world before between podcasts. Keep writing, Red Sneaker Writers, and remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.